All right, everybody, let's get going. Again, welcome. End of year Marketo tune-up. This is a November deep dish. I am Amy Han from Letus. I head up the training and development over here and love all of things Marketo. I've been doing this for quite a while. I'm a Marketo um, certified master um, and uh, they used to call it an architect. So an MCSA and an MCE a few times over. And Letus, uh, if you're not familiar with the company, is a consultancy that helps organizations grow their pipeline by optimizing marketing automation platforms. So we focus on helping companies define their lead generation strategy, implement automation tools like Marketo, and ultimately drive growth for sales. Uh, this looks like a lot of things. This is marketing consulting, everything from marketing automation evaluations to campaign planning and strategy to MarTech stack road mapping to the technical consulting of onboarding and implementations, custom integrations with third-party tools between systems like Marketo um, and third-party providers, instance reviews and audits, and then, of course, managed services. Um, we help with the day-to-day -day ins and outs of running Marketo, standing up campaigns, and making sure you're using best practice approaches with your tools. Thank you for joining. These deep dishes are a great opportunity to not only um, learn from, from my experiences, but um, it's a great to have a pulse on what everybody is experiencing. What we try to do here at Letus is provide these deep dishes to talk about things that have come up with your tools, Marketo specifically for this, for this deep dish, and provide um, ways to use best practices to really uh, make your tool uh, shine here. And so let's talk about ways you can gear up for 2023. Couple housekeeping tips. If you have any questions, um, feel free to send them in the chat. I will address as many as possible towards the end of the question, uh, the session here. I'm also recording, um, and we'll send this uh, recording and information out after the call. And of course, feel free to email me with any specific questions or ways we can help uh, in the future. All right. So I think the the biggest thing we we run into when we work with organizations and they ask about optimizing Marketo um, is that it can be overwhelming knowing where to start. So if we're trying to get set up with great foundational best practice for the new year, what are some of the key areas we need to take a look at um, to really get that good foundation set? And what I'll share with you today are a few places to, to think about digging into a little bit more, um, places that might provide some quick wins, and then ways to think about your strategy moving forward. So these key areas we, we typically look at include things like data and structure, how your data looks, whether when it comes to uh, hygiene. We'll talk about that briefly. Uh, your lead management approach and ways you can start to quickly uh, engage more with your leads and also pass really important uh, information over to sales. Your engagement. So in, in kind of in tandem with that lead management, ways you're using the tool to better engage um, and maybe some tools you haven't thought of within, within Marketo that will help you with that or how to get started um, really with, with some of the engagement tools if you haven't yet. And of course, reporting. How do we start making some of what you've already purchased shine? I think you have some quick wins probably with your reporting that you may not uh, have even known was there. So let's talk about the key data and structural areas that we wanna look at in Marketo to create that really uh, sort of well-oiled machine here. I think there's some low-hanging fruit that we can take a look at right away, which is checking your notifications for things that are easily remedied or might be causing a larger um, 
our larger issues with integrations with say your CRM or third party tools. For example, when I log into Marketo, you'll see that this notifications area, um, when you log in, you very likely see that there are notifications here, but it's always a best practice to go in and, and double check this occasionally. I think it can be easy to forget that this is here, but you might find tucked in here some pretty interesting data points that will give you information about potential field sync errors. Very often we see when syncing with a system like Salesforce or Microsoft Dynamics, that people aren't syncing due to field errors or um, even things like uh, incorrect pick, pick list values being added, which are preventing people from syncing between your systems. And it can be really easily missed. Another thing uh, you can take a look at here is just, just kind of what's been going on. If any field data has changed, if you have any trigger campaigns that are um, being cleaned up or scheduled to go idle, Marketo will automatically clean up and remove idle trigger campaigns. You can also subscribe to these notifications, which I think is helpful. You can do so right in that notifications area. So really quick place to check is these notifications and just really focus on any of those sync errors that are coming across as well. Um, you can also find sync errors in your admin section right in the CRM sync area. You will get specific errors. So that can be some quick wins if you work with your team on those. Now, speaking of data, um, Marketo is really going to shine best when you are really focusing on maintaining good data hygiene. Um, we do this through ongoing automated data hygiene campaigns and standardization and normalization campaigns. There are some best practice approaches to normalization. I'm going to go to the marketing activities area here. And that is to set up some operational programs that are consistently looking for that, that information. So we're listening for things like consistent hard bounces. We're listening for things like consistent soft bounces. We might be running a batch campaign every day, listening for or looking for people that have certain data values that we want to normalize. For example, if in the past, um, you have not paid attention to what people are putting in on their forms. They might have been inputting different job titles, uh, adding their state, uh, the full state name instead of the abbreviation. They might be adding their own department names. And you might really need that to be more normalized. Say you want people to have uh, only specific titles or use state abbreviations. You can start looking for that information and remediating that using smart campaigns. So I can look for things like, well, the state is not empty. And if the state is long form here, let's change that to the abbreviation. And I can use what are called choice steps to take care of this in bulk. So I could look for things like um, job title contains, and then maybe do some normalization to standardize some of those job titles. This is a great place to start really aligning that data so that you can more easily create smart lists and audiences and segmentations uh, for your targeted communications and to then um, kind of expand and enhance your engagement. Of course, the best practice after that cleanup is to then utilize pick lists in your forms as a way to standardize and normalize data right out of the gate. So give people the options they can choose to standardize that data and you don't have to worry about cleaning it up later on. The other thing to consider if you have an issue with duplicates is to create an internal alert that lets you know when a person is created with a potential duplicate field. We can listen for that being created and we can look for potential duplicate fields of email address, full name, 
last name. Email address is going to be your, your kind of easiest one there. And then send an internal alert that says, hey, this person is potentially a duplicate. You could send it to the sales owner, or you could type in your own email address. Just as an easy way to get ahead of that duplicate so you can take action sooner. Uh, it's easier to do that uh, on an ongoing basis than it is to go back and merge thousands of duplicates, as we probably all know. Another thing to consider um, is things like auto deletions. If you want to be deleting people who are deleted in your CRM, note that they are not automatically deleted in Marketo. So you might want to listen for if a person is deleted in that CRM and then carry out a deletion in Marketo as well. So listening for hard bounces, soft bounces, um, duplicates, Things like that are, are fairly straightforward, but what do you do with, with groups of people that you have identified that have invalid email addresses or have hard bounced multiple times um, or maybe have unsubscribed? It's a great time to come up with a process for reviewing why people have bounced, why people are invalid, and assessing whether or not we want to keep them in the database um, and thinking about purging them. Of course, we, we would consider purging people because, of course, you, you want to make sure that you're underneath your database limit. You're paying for, for people here who are inactive in the database. Um, some people you're not going to get through to again, so they're taking up space, of course. So if we think about purging unsubscribes, for example, some people pull those out uh, as, a, as a first line of defense. That is a, a good thing to think about. However, you really want to think if you're deleting, are these people engaging elsewhere? Okay, so even if they bounced or they're unsubscribed, take a look at any recent activity on potential purge lists and see if they have been active online or if there's potential ways to, to retarget them um, via other channels. So it's good to pull these lists, but doing some cross-referencing on whether or not they're active via website, website visits, et cetera, um, is a good thing to do before we completely purge. And of course, when you do purge, it's always a best practice to save that file for the future, okay? Something else you can do to really understand why people are invalid or have hard bounced is to take a look at bounce categories. Uh, this is something that um, you can do by looking within a smart list and using a constraint. So I can actually pull in bounce categories, category one, two, or three, bounce details or subcategories. So I could actually pull out people who have sent back or their email provider has sent back information that this has been identified as spam or this person has um, block listed this IP address. Sometimes we will get pretty specific details back and it's good to do an assessment of that, not only to decide who you wanna purge, but also for just uh, data maintenance and hygiene and deliverability. We want to make sure that we're not identified too often as spam. So this data maintenance is twofold, um, cleaning up for you, um, maintaining good deliverability for the future engagement in your database. All right. The other thing that is a new feature in Marketo is enabling global form validation. So often people will complain about form submissions, that they've had bot, uh, bot form submissions or spam form submissions. There's a new feature in Marketo in the admin section that allows you to actually restrict certain email addresses from submitting forms. There's a built-in one that is a Marketo defined list of consumer email domains, you can click on that list to see which ones they are that you can activate. 
uh, it will then prevent that submission and say, please enter a valid business email address. You can also create your own rules so that if you're seeing very specific domains, you can put those in there yourself. So in addition to aligning your forms with um, those pick lists and kind of uh, structuring that so that your form submissions use a certain data structure, I would encourage you to look at that form validation rule to help clean up, clean up the data. All right. Another best practice to think about moving forward if you have not already is building a center of excellence. So we can look at the data and make sure we're starting off with a clean slate, but we also want to make sure that we are creating some best practice program templates um, that give us our naming conventions, our best practice naming conventions that we use in the organization that show people who are using the tool the best practice program setup for the different type of programs we have that utilize any tokens, program tokens that we are using within our programs and that have a standard set of assets like emails, landing page, or any local forms that we're using within our programs. These serve as the model for people. It can, as, as Marketo grows, it can get tough to get everybody on the same page with building things the same way naming things the same way, um, using the same assets. And so it is a, a great idea to create a center of excellence to really outline that for people so that not only can they go back and take a look at those best practice programs that you've identified, but they can clone them if they need to start from scratch. For example, if we look at a webinar program here, you can create a structure um, with naming conventions that you'll use repeatedly, local assets folders, smart campaign folder. And then you can essentially say, these are the emails that we're consistently using within a webinar program. So people can go back and take a look. You can make sure branding is aligned. You can also make sure that if you're using tokens, the tokens, here are all placed in the assets and easily updatable on the program level. So you can build all of your assets essentially with tokens, things like body copy, save the date information, everything from rich text to plain text or even velocity scripting to help make building the assets in your program really easy, scalable, and aligned. The other benefit of these program, best practice program structures is that you're able to go into the setup and guide people on the different tags or costs that might be associated and really prompt them to, you know, hey, let's make sure that we're tagging this program appropriately, we're adding the appropriate cost, et cetera. So a center of excellence would be a great place to start in the new year if you have not started building it. So now that we've taken care of some of the good data areas to think of, places that we like to focus when we start this conversation, let's talk a little bit more about lead management. There are some key areas for lead management that we take a look at um, things like acquisition. Are you tracking people's first touch program? Are you tracking things like person source? And do you have a UTM strategy or a URL, uh, URL UTM strategy to track sources and campaign and medium? Are you utilizing your revenue cycle model and a life cycle in line with that? Are you using best practice program setup? And have you optimized sales insight for sales if that is a tool that you have? And of course, this is really important because it gets at the root of Marketo, which is helping you track attribution and showing ROI for your programs. So this allows you to dedicate resources more efficiently, of course, 
gives you insights into channels and program performance and influence on where people are in your life cycle and impact on revenue. So this enables better communication, um, better engagement with people, and good handoff to sales and insight into that funnel. So let's take a look at why acquisition is important. Acquisition is your first touch. So if we think about how Marketo tracks attribution, it does it in two ways. It tracks first touch attribution using acquisition, which is the first program a person is associated with when they are created in Marketo. So if I sign up for a webinar and I'm created in Marketo, that webinar gets credit for my first touch. It is my acquisition program. It will mark the acquisition and the acquisition date when it's identified. This is that first touch. Thereafter, every program I'm a member of, as long as I'm setting up my programs correctly, will be given credit as multi-touch. So if I'm a member of five programs from first to last, all of those five programs get even credit as multi-touch, as a good mix for getting me to, say, uh, convert into an opportunity. So those five programs would be identified as this is the good, this is the right mix for that opportunity, but the first touch or acquisition is the best at converting new people or creating new people in the system. There's a few ways to do this in Marketo. So let's take a, a look at what's important about this. Acquisition is only automatically set when a new lead fills out a local form on a local Marketo landing page within a program. What I mean by that is that within a program, I can use local assets or I can reference global assets. So for a webinar, I could create a landing page within the program here for people to go to and fill out a form on. And I could create a form also within this program that is very specific to this program and to this landing page. If I put that form on this landing page and somebody fills that out, they will automatically become a member of this program, okay? So when they fill that form out, you will see acquired by, you will see this, the count here. And when a person comes in, you will see this little acquired by, this little person here. Uh, that will automatically happen. Now, if I have a landing page, but I'm using a global form from say the design studio, let's say I have a handful of forms. One might be for webinar registration. One might be for a content download. One might be a contact us form. I've got a handful of forms because I don't want to recreate hundreds of forms, you know, for every program. I need to make sure that within my registration flow or, or wherever that form is being filled out, that I'm listening for the specific activity there. So I'm listening for that they filled out the global form, that global webinar form. I'm identifying that it's on the specific program's landing page, or it could be my external website. And in that flow, because it's not automatically going to be tra tracked, I need to account for acquisition. So I need a flow step that looks for if the acquisition program is empty, we're going to set that acquisition program as this program. Again, if I'm using non-local assets or a global form, I need to make sure I'm accounting for that acquisition. I need to make sure I'm saying anyone that is associated with this program for first touch needs to have that acquisition marked. The other way I can do this, so I have the automatic set, I have the change data value flows we just saw. I can also set this during list import. You will notice in the database when you import people via a list, for example, if you potentially go to a trade show and you bring a list of people in, I could bring them into the database and I could set their acquisition program during that import, 
or I could zip them right into the program itself and update their member status. So within the program, I could import members into the members tab here. And it will ask me to choose the status of the person so I could set their acquisition. Or if I import them into the database, I can assign their acquisition program. Again, this is very important because Marketo works best when we're tracking that attribution. Now, everyone is probably thinking, oh, I haven't been doing this, or maybe some people have forgotten this in the past. That is all right. Um, what we would suggest is actually heading back to your, at, uh, your, your database here, going to the system smart list called No Acquisition Program. This is going to tell you who does not have one. There are a couple ways to think about how I can historically mark this, but this is going to give you an idea of who does not have it, and you can do a little bit of a deep dive on um, who those people are and maybe where to assign them. But you can see empty acquisition in this in this area. Okay. First thing to do, though, is make sure you're getting that set. The other thing to think about here, and I'm going to jump back to my program, is to think about how you're marking people's sources. So the source is separate from the acquisition. The acquisition is the first program. The source is how they got there, right? There are different ways to set person source and good strategies for setting ongoing, ongoing sources. The first would be within each program to look whether the person source is empty when a person fills out a form implying that they are new and set their person source in a line in alignment with that program type. So if they're brand new, having filled out this webinar form, with an empty source, I'm gonna set their overall source as webinar. I can get pretty granular. I can set person source details as well. I can create some custom fields to round out that data. I can also create a more global operational campaign that is listening for leads being created and setting person source this is a great opportunity to actually use executable campaigns, which is a newer feature in Marketo. But it would be listening for what the source is and setting it on an ongoing basis and takes it out of that individual program setup. So a couple of ways to do it there. We also do not want to forget if we're talking about attribution, we're talking about where people are coming from, their first touch program, the program set up with channels and tags. Let's go to the admin section. We're going to take a look at tags. Every program you create in Marketo is channeled according to channels you have set up or what could be considered the delivery mechanism or the larger category of communication. So for example, all of my webinars would be part of the webinar channel. I may have a newsletter channel. So email sends for my newsletters would be channeled accordingly. There's a nurture channel, online advertising, or even more granularly paid search, paid social. So these are all of the ways you're engaging with your audience. Let's take a look at webinar. You'll want to just take a run through all of your current channels and take a look at your statuses and see if these statuses are aligning with how people are currently moving through each of your programs and whether success has been marked accurately. So essentially, what is the best outcome of all programs within this channel? For webinar, it would be that people have attended or attended on demand. And it's a good opportunity to actually hide old statuses or actually hide old channels that you haven't been using. This is also a great place to review your existing tags and to 
require or go more specific with the tags you're requiring. These are ways to create better reporting. So for every program, I can tag it with things like products that we're promoting with that program, who created the program. I could even add the, the year or the quarter the program was created. Requiring tags will help create better reporting because I will be able to then run reports on show me all the webinars promoting product A as compared to webinars promoting product B. I can also hide old tags. It's a great opportunity to just kind of update, clean up, and hide old channels. We don't delete old channels, but we hide them. That is because old older channels are still in use and we don't want to remove that data but we can hide unused channels, okay? All right. Talked a little bit about tracking our sources, updating person sources. And we highly recommend that you start thinking about a UTM strategy. Create URLs with UTM terms like source, campaign, content that you add to all of the links. So anywhere I can go where I might visit or fill out a form on any of our tracked pages, we use and actually pass to hidden form fields in Marketo to stamp our most recent source, our most recent campaign, our most recent content. And this allows us to not only listen for that original source, as we discussed, looking for where people came from originally when they were created, whether it was um, via webinar, uh, via online content, paid social, but it also allows us to do ongoing tracking of where people are or their most recent activity is. So every form they fill out, we will get this most recent source and campaign and content and medium we're able to pass that information over to sales, as well as pull this information into reporting in Marketo to get more of that um, kind of multi-touch, full, full path attribution. You'll wanna take a look at your life cycle and revenue modeler. Depending on what you have purchased with Marketo, you do have available a revenue cycle model, which allows you to fully define your success path or how people are moving along your funnel or life cycle. You can see, for example, this might look like tracking everyone from anonymous to known to active, that we're doing active outreach, sending them communications, to them being engaged, to accruing a certain amount of points to MQL, all the way to closed one. This is an opportunity to really either A, build, build your revenue cycle model so you can start tracking how people are moving, see the velocity, see how long people are staying in any given stage, find any bottlenecks and see how long people are getting stuck in certain stages. But we also want to align this with a life cycle program outside of the RCM. So a best practice is actually, actually to create this model and a life cycle in tandem so that we can utilize some custom fields to really listen and give us more control and insight into what's happening. So for example, I would create a matching life cycle program and campaigns that are listening for activities and changing the revenue stage outside of the model. So I'm updating my revenue stage and I'm using custom fields to update life cycle stage. Not only does this give us a little bit more control over how we're moving people, but it also lets us have sales 
kind of take their hands off. We can ha- we can take people's hands off the model and have it just listen a little bit more. So we're listening for sales activities. We're listening for marketing activities. And we're moving people appropriately down the stages by, by kind of working in tandem. So best practice is to really utilize a life cycle program and a revenue cycle model that shake hands to give you really good details about how people are moving through your models and also more granular information on when life cycle stages are changing. I have the ability to update most recent dates. So most recency of activity, when people's most recent MQL was, et cetera. Lastly, for lead management, we're going to try to close the loop a little bit with sales and look at some of the new features that Sales Insight has been rolling out. Sales Insight Actions is in a phased rollout stage right now. You can always contact your um, customer success manager about when this will be enabled for you. But there's some really cool features that allow for increased personalization, Um, allows sales to send really personalized emails and track the view, click and reply to of those emails, enables copy and blind copy. And there's a lot of increased activity logging uh, within Salesforce and also in Marketo. Sales is able to add people to sales campaigns and playbooks, which is essentially a sequence of tasks and emails happening in Salesforce. And we can listen at the same time for triggers around that in Marketo. So we can pull information based on sales activities into what we're doing in Marketo to really make sure the engagement is well-timed. There is a sales dialer that logs calls. So they are able to make calls via Sales Insight and we can look at that activity in Marketo. Marketo. And there's some expanded task creation capabilities. There's even a kind of a live feed doc that they're able to see um, with certain people that is really, really cool. So you will see this uh, start to roll out. And if you're interested, again, um, you can always ping us uh, about how to contact your CSM if you don't know who they are, um, but they can let you know when that will be enabled for you. All right. So what is the point of all of everything we just talked about? Why is it important to, you know, look at your life cycle and revenue cycle model and have models work in tandem? Why is it important to track attribution, um, first touch source? Why is it important to make sure your channel is all aligned? That is because we want you to be able to enhance your reporting, get some quick wins, and actually, you know, get the reports that you paid for. There are really cool ways to utilize reports that are um, kind of at the tips of your fingers if we just get some of this kind of program set up foundational stuff uh, good to go, okay? So there's a few key areas to look at now. Um, First things first, before we get into some more specific reports, understand that you can now filter bots out of your email reporting for better metrics. You have the option within the admin section in the email of either logging bot activity or filtering it out entirely. Um, Logging will mean that you are able to actually create smart lists that will look for, hey, this person might be a bot. And so you can pull people who are, that have, you know, that are companies that are using bot clickers that are clicking your emails to check for spam, you can see a list of those domains, those people. You could therefore then pull them out of your reporting once you've identified them, or we can actually filter them from the get-go, meaning we're just going to pull them out, the open and link click activity that we know is generated by that bot. Marketo is doing this with a, a couple different ways. There are some lists that it looks at of known bot bot domain, uh, you know, trackers, and there's also proximity pattern tracking. 
So I would suggest that you go enable that or start running some lists as well to see what that does to your email metrics, specifically your opens and clicks. Now, once we know that we are using that kind of best practice program set up, we are gonna make sure we're enabling our reports, okay? The ones that we have here. I'm gonna remind you again of the areas of focus that we want to look at to fine tune that reporting. This is what we've touched on, that we're making sure that your programs are set up to track acquisition. And another best practice, I'm gonna show you something here in the admin section. you're going to see something called analytics behavior referenced occasionally. If I go to webinar, every channel has something called analytics behavior. By default, this is marked as normal, which means that in order to show up in some more of your advanced reports, programs need a period cost. They need a, a monthly cost associated with them to show up the right way. We can change this to inclusive, which means they will show up regardless of that cost, or operational, which means we can hide them from reporting. I would suggest you make these inclusive if the cost is not something you've been utilizing, but I would also suggest that you go through your programs and even when there isn't a cost associated, add zero because that really is gonna make your reporting shine. So how do I do that? Within any program, I can go to the setup and I can drag in a cost. This is a monthly cost, program month. You can either put one cost or if you have a cost associated, this month it might've cost $1,000, you can add that as well. You wanna make sure there's a cost in there, even if it's zero or if you have it, of course. The reason for that is that that is going to then give you a great breakdown of your cost per members, cost per people hitting success in your program, and then it will open up performance insights and anal analyzer reports to show you which programs are the best and most cost effective at creating success and converting people into opportunities. We want to make sure again that those channels and tags are tracking the right statuses and successes. We're adding and requiring tags for more granular reporting. That we're tracking those touch points using UTMs um, to look for the campaigns and ongoing sources and mediums for people, how they're engaging with our content. Another key aspect if you're syncing with a CRM is to make sure that your CRM is set up accurately to display contacts associated to opportunities. For Salesforce, for example, we want to make sure that contacts have associated roles in an opportunity to really get good reporting in Marketo. Your other tools are making sure your life cycle and revenue cycle model are set up well, that we're starting to access some of our advanced reporting. And if you're able to, and you've purchased it, um, either set up or explore getting Marketo measure, which is gonna be really robust multi-touch attribution reporting. It really is like the best in class for, for multi-touch attribution. What this allows us to do then is unlock reports like Program Analyzer. This is a phenomenally good visual model when information starts flowing into it that lets us look at which programs and channels are the best at creating things like pipeline, you know, or, or opportunities. So in this example, you can see which programs or channels are the best at creating or the, being the first touch programs at creating pipeline. You can look at multi-touch as well. So it will give you this cool mix of um, using bubbles that you're able to, to toggle and update. You can change the bubble size and color. And if you're using Revenue Explorer, which is a very advanced report, you can click right into Revenue Explorer to see further information to slice and dice that data. 
Another quick win, once you have set up really good program setup, things like channels and tags and period costs, is performance insights. It will start giving you data right away. It does take about 24 hours to update as, a, as an aside, but you'll start to see first touch and multi-touch performance as it relates to opportunities created, new names created, um, influence on pipeline and revenue, channel program effectiveness, and you can click and drill into really specific details. I can pull in my program tags, for example, so I can drill into, show me performance of all of these, all of these programs within this channel, but show me based on division or show me based on a specific segmentation or audience that I've created. This is a really, a huge quick win once you, you get things kind of target, you know, like tightened up a little bit, you'll start to see data flow in here and you can see some great contribution and trends to pipeline and revenue and overall engagement. Another mod, another kind of brief overview, once you have your life cycle and revenue cycle model aligned, is people by revenue stage, you can start taking a look at where people are in your model and actually drill into custom attributes of those people. So I can start to take a look at, show me where people are, maybe in my MQL stage, and bring in a custom column that shows me their most recent um, source. So if we're using those UTM values, I can start to see, okay, what was the most recent source of these MQLs? And what seems to be driving, what sort of seems to be driving that, that um, marketing qualification. So there's these little kind of data that starts to, to bubble up when things are set up correctly, which you may not have noticed before or had access to before. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Marketo Measure, previously known as Visible. This is really going to be a full bore, you know, uh, kind of plug and play insight into which efforts, which what marketing is really the most effective at driving revenue, and it lets you create really robust models. So while Marketo can look at first touch and multi touch, Marketo Measure can create all sorts of different models, divide and um, give credit differently. Um, and it's looking across all channels as well. Um, happy to talk to you more about if Marketo Measure is right for you and your organization. All right. Last but not least, I wanted to just call out a couple of things to keep top of mind for 2023 that should be key ways to engage um, that you can experiment with. If you do not have a chat bot on your website yet and are interested in it, check out Marketo's dynamic chat. Um, it is free and it has been if you with your, your, your instance and it has been rolled out and has been kind of in a phased rollout. This allows you to add a bot right away into your site, collect things like name, contact information, and really customize that engagement on your website. People can also book meetings with your sales team via the bot. So dynamic chat is something to think about using if you're not already using a chat bot. Again, really great way to capture more details, um, bring people into Marketo, and then utilize this for scheduling with sales to really to give people a direct route to your sales team. And let this be the year that you start using Marketo engagement program programs and more complex approaches to nurturing. Marketo's engagement programs are extremely powerful and really are where the full bore automation is when it comes to lead generation, um, nurturing, onboarding, and creating that long term personalized, um, really like you know, relationship with your audiences. So there are simple ways to do engagement programs where we can create one stream that 
we keep adding content to um, over a period of time, anywhere from two weeks to, to six months to a year. But I would strongly suggest exploring how embedded programs within your engagement programs can really help you cater to specific audiences within your streams. It allows me to get more personalized. It allows me to speak specifically to people around the actions they've taken within specific streams before I then move them to additional streams. Embedded programs are a, a place that people get a little nervous around, but with the right strategy and approach can be really effective and efficient, efficient ways to nurture. I would love to talk to you more about how you could start utilizing engagement programs to fit your needs. So we took a look at some of the main data structure areas, key areas for lead management, reporting, unlocking some key reports, and some engagement. And I'm going to take a couple questions now. I saw a couple questions come in via chat. I have time for a, a couple here. Um, there's a question here. If I purge unsubscribe people from my database, what happens if they come back into my database? All right, that's a great question. So if you delete people who have unsubscribed from your instance and they come back, Marketo has something called durable unsubscribe, which means they will be automatically re-unsubscribed the minute they're created. So that can be great, but that can also be problematic if you know if sales zips them in and, and imports them or somebody puts them in on a list, uh, we want them to stay unsubscribed, right? But if that person fills out a form or a preference center and they're marked as unsubscribe, we want to listen for that and then re-opt them in. So you can create some automation around if a person is created and they are unsubscribed to mark them as not unsubscribed once they're created. Very good question, but do understand that you are safe if you do export people, delete them from your database, and they come back in, they'll automatically be unsubscribed, and there are ways to work with that data moving forward. All right. Another one here. How do I know what reporting access I have? So how do I know if I have access or, you know, what reports I have in my instance? So um, first thing would be to, if you have access to your contract, right, to, to go back and check what is in your Marketo contract. The other thing would be, if you are not an admin, check with your admin um, to see if they're able to broaden your permissions. Um, there are roles, users and roles, and there are ways to provide access to all of the analytics that are available. Um, so it might be that you don't have access to all those analytics or features or tools. So that would be an internal discussion and just kind of a review of what you have in your instance, what you can open up, what you have access to. All right. How do I reset acquisition for empty acquisition program? This is a great one. So we can identify people who have an empty acquisition program. And there's a couple of ways to think about this. If I have found that a thousand people, we'll just, we'll just say a thousand people do not have an acquisition program. I could go in to individual people within the database. And so on that list, I could say, you know, no acquisition program. I could grab a person. Um, let's see, we could just grab my old record here. And you can do a little bit of a... Um, treasure hunt or a little bit of a, it's kind of solving a mystery um, to get some details about where they originally came from. So within the activity record, I'm very often able to see the original source type registration info. And this new person information tells me this person was manually created, but you'll often see that the original source type might be, um, you know, uh, your website, or there could be a URL or original referrer, there might be a URL. So you're able to actually bucket people into some general places where they've come from. And I could then 
theoretically take those people and assign them to the program they should be. I could, I could understand, oh, if this person came from this URL, they, they probably came in via this webinar. And I could go in and I could set the acquisition that way. But very often the people that are in your database that don't have an acquisition maybe came from a migration from another system or a huge list import from your CRM. And we maybe don't know where they came from anymore. You could create like a dummy program almost, an operational program that would be like legacy leads and just call that acquisition, you know, legacy leads or um, original acquisition or something along those lines. And you could actually set that kind of default acquisition for all of those people so that they have something there. The reason I want to do that, I want to get information there, is that in the future, if I start using a strategy where I'm marking people with an empty acquisition because I'm assuming that they're new, I could be marking acquisition for people that just didn't ever have it in the first place, right? So I do want to make sure that acquisition is set before I move forward with my new strategy. Okay. Great questions. And we've about reached the, the top of the hour here. I appreciate your time. Of course, we're here to help. Um, I offer one-on-one -on -one training and support. We offer, um, as a company, uh, training and support. And we also have an online learning management system if you like to learn at your own pace. Um, would love to talk to you more about how we can support you here in the new year. I appreciate your time and have a wonderful week.